welcome to the Curious About Nature podcast. This is a podcast for folks who want to connect with nature and rewild childhood. Hosted by Rachel Mills, Buttercup Learning's founder, an educator with 20 plus years of experience with a passion for animation, the natural world and conservation. Rachel focuses on getting digital kids outdoors and having fun in nature promoting well-being and a can-do attitude to local wildlife conservation and sustainable living. Join her and her guests for their stories, experiences and tips to support outdoor learning and nature connection. Welcome to the Curious About Nature podcast. Uh, this month, I'm joined by Jill Erskine, the co-founder of Wild Strong, startup awards finalist in 2023 and 2024. Wildstrong run family movement clubs, which focus on multi-generational movement and teaching physical literacy through outdoor play. So I connected with Jill after she posted in a Facebook group, her family were going to go phone free over Christmas. So Jill, tell me, why did you want to go smartphone free? Hi, Rachel. Thanks for having me on. Hi. You're very welcome. I think I... With my kids, they're seven and five now. At Christmas, they were six and four. Still pretty yeah. small. But because I run Wild Strong with my husband, and it's a small company, and a lot of our, a lot of our marketing and contact with our kind of members and clients all goes through social media. It's been interesting to me to see how much more time I have to spend on Instagram and Facebook and. I enjoy the contact with other people in the way that it does introduce me to really interesting people, but it also just means you spend a lot of time on your phone when actually a whole of Wildstrong's ethos is about getting people outside <laughs> to spend time together and not be on our phones. Um, and so it just become really apparent that we were spending a lot of time just checking messages that we thought were very important. So we thought actually Christmas is a very good time to just do phone free anyway, because there's loads of other stuff going on. Yeah, it was five days. It was interesting because we didn't have any maps and we were visiting my in-laws. And so we didn't really know where to go a lot of the time. But that was interesting also as we had to get out and ask people directions and get lost a lot so that was quite fun too yeah it's it really resonates with me because obviously as a small business owner and a lecturer I spend a lot of time either on screens answering student queries managing my business juggling family life and I think lots of us are, have I've got so used to reaching for our smartphone whether it's like looking something up to to find out a di directions or checking the time even so even though we might have a physical clock on the wall I've actually found myself looking at my mobile instead and uh, it just becomes it's just become so ingrained in our psyche to use it I think it's true um, and it's really even just looking back in the last five years I feel like it's changed mm -hmm. for me I, I know that I've got my watch it's been sitting on my desk for about three months waiting for me to go and put a new battery in it and I haven't done it and I really enjoy wearing a watch because it means that I don't need to check my phone for the time. But yeah, it's funny. We just use them for everything and they do feel like they seep into every single part of our life. Yeah. So whilst you were away then, you mentioned about the, the obviously not having your kind of GPS guided smartphone device to tell you what to go and where to go, possibly. I suppose that probably made you actually engage more with people around you like to find out a little bit more about like the local area or or yeah. to get to places yeah and I think also so I really love I love maps <laughs> I've always loved maps <laughs> and I really I have a good sense of direction I like knowing the lay of the land and where how everything connects my husband is on the other end of that spectrum where he's mostly lost regardless of whether he has a smartphone but I have noticed that because I always have a smartphone on me now I so rarely look at a, a map and mm -hmm. take the time to get to know how things connect so it was actually yeah it was really fun I mean it, we were in my my husband's American we were in a quite a strange part of Florida and we did take about two hours longer to get to our destination 
<laughs> as a result. But we met some interesting characters along the way. And yeah, it was pretty, we weren't really on a timeline, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah, I think we have got used to that idea of like instantaneous, like knowing something or knowing how to get somewhere. Um, yeah. And maybe having that time to slow down and to really be mindful of what you're doing. I'm sure that brought up an interesting thought around modern day living as well for you. Yeah, there's a lot of, I think with parents and in, in recent months, there's this smartphone free childhood yeah. group that started up, which I think is fantastic, but I find it very hard to engage with because it's on WhatsApp and, and yeah. all my other school groups are on WhatsApp and it's just unbearable because I can't, there's something about WhatsApp I'm fine with it if it's, I will t meet you off the bus at this time for that kind of correspondence or here is a cute picture of my child doing something. I'm also fine with that. But for sort of yeah. detailed debates, it's not the forum for it, which I, so I'm sort of slightly hoping that they'll move that conversation away from WhatsApp. <laughs> with school kids, with kids our age, all of their friends have tablets or some kind of device, yeah. like whether it's a switch or whatever. If you're working full time and sometimes you just need to plug your children in and there isn't another option. And we are very lucky where we live. We live on a farm. The kids have loads of outdoor space. We can just kick them out and they yeah. come back in it when we call them. But that is a real privilege. But at the same time, my eldest has had to, we don't have any, we don't have a switch, but he's completely versed and he's learned every single I don't know, part of Zelda the game and he can talk fluently about this game that he has only played at his friend's house maybe once or twice <laughs> but that's their language at school and it's so important to them which it feels like the sort of step before he's going to start asking for us which is terrifying yeah my, my daughter's eight and we've we discussed this with her recently because uh, one of her friends who's only eight has got a smartphone and and again we understand it's parental choice but it was that thing of we, when we leave a, a device that's actually meant for adults open to children, the kind of things that they start to see, and from my experiences of being an animation lecturer as well, some of the stories from those young adults that I've spoken to about their kind of digital childhood, it is quite eye-opening and, and quite worrying, the amount of sexual content and inappropriate adult-based uh, content that they, they've seen at such very young ages. So we, we've had to have conversations, some quite tricky conversations with my daughter's friend's parents. And it is that thing of don't want to be seen to be, what's the word, rude or coming down on somebody else's parenting. But I think we're, we're, I think we're at that start now. And I think that smartphone free childhood, that movement has given me, I don't know about you, but a sense of, okay, what I'm trying to do with my own family, there are lots of other people who feel the same way. And yeah. that, I think, is a positive that we're starting to have those conversations about what is appropriate. I think e-learning and use of apps when it's educational and done in a measured way can be appropriate. But it's about the quantity of that, that, that time on a screen. There's so much we can learn from physically doing something and being outdoors. And the benefits just outweigh even the learning in lots of respects. Uh, oh, which for sure. Yeah, I would agree with that 100%. Yeah. But yeah, I'm not a teacher in our local primary school, so I respect that they they have to use yeah. tablets occasionally. I, I definitely think that we don't need to use tablets in a school setting. It feels slightly counter. Why are we sending our children to school? And I think probably for me, the first thing is to socialise and understand how to work alongside others that you perhaps don't get on with or mm. see other viewpoints. I look at how much I use it mm. now and I struggle to control how much time you give that to a child. And it seems to me such a clear argument. It's such an, it's a terrible idea to let your children have, to let our children, or even I feel like maybe in adults, maybe none of us see mobile phones. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, if I just see how much we've had to, since that Christmas break, and now we have screen-free Sundays, which is really nice, and we don't have them at all. We do need to use them for work, but it definitely eats away at me. I think, I think we're in the same kind of mental headspace in that respect, because I have now started seeing my smart devices as work tools rather than communication tools anymore. And I'd quite like to just get a separate 
I guess we could call it a dumb phone, which I don't like calling that, but a, a non-smart phone, a phone that's old yeah. school maybe, and use I that for, actually, yeah. Yeah, we have a, an iPhone for work that has all the social media stuff on it. Yeah. And my other phone is very old and quite clunky. I do still have to have WhatsApp on it. Yeah. Um, but maybe when we all decide that we don't want to be on WhatsApp, then I can move on. Yeah, I have had that conversation with my husband. Do we really need to be on the WhatsApp group for the next school? Because my daughter go, goes to middle school in September. So it's a different school, same friendship group. And he's, oh, I think we need to. And I'm like, do we really need to? Do we actually really need to know the inner workings of everything to be able to navigate school? As a fairly disorganised parent, I think that's why I stay on yeah. WhatsApp group. There's always somebody who's much better than I am at reminding people yeah. that today is World Book Day <laughs> or whatever. And I don't seem to be able to internalise any of these dates. So you mentioned that you'd obviously reduced your screen time and your smartphone usage since your screen time free uh, Christmas. Beyond the sort of Sunday, like no smartphones, that, that screen free time with family, have you found any other kind of ways to reduce your dependency or usage I should say oh, no it's definitely dependency yeah. I'm very aware of that yeah so we try now because we've got the work phone we try to leave it in the office when we leave work it's, it's tricky when you work at home as well it, everything merges right yes but we try to keep it in the office when we leave work and not use it and then with Andrew my husband just being mindful of not being on our phones in the evenings mm-hmm. um we're trying to do more like calling people, <laughs> which sounds <laughs> it's a very simple thing, but actually calling people rather than sending them messages is actually really nice. There's not a hard and fast rule, but we try not to have the phones out in the evening. So are you intending to wait for things like social media until your children are adults? They're probably being exposed to it through friends anyway, and possibly even through some school stuff. Yeah, and also through our website. Yeah. Well loads of posts of them but they're aware that we use it if i can keep both of my children off social media until they're sort of 16 i'll be very pleased with myself yes. <laughs> i don't know if it's gonna be possible but i wasn't like my ears pierced until i was 16 so you know i don't know i mean they're both boys so i think our biggest risk for young boys is sort of computer games and getting into that gaming culture rather than instagram for young girls but I mean they do need to be aware of Instagram and all of that stuff that comes with it but I think probably our biggest risk is video games but then there's the thing when they go to secondary Mm. whether they need the smartphone and obviously we're not there yet so I'm slightly hoping that by the time our children are old enough to go to secondary that conversation will be more for me it feels like a lot more people are having that conversation on the back of the smartphone free childhood debate and the the kind of unifying power of those conversations and the idea of having parental pledges and things that makes total sense to me but I'm slightly hoping that by the time we get there it will it'll be more normal not to have one yeah yeah I think uh, similar as well starting to see a lot more schools taking ownership of that by saying that smartphones or any mobile device is not to be used during school time some of the extreme measures that some schools are going to with um, buying into um, lockbox, put the smartphones in. That makes, that makes complete sense to me, though. They're designed to be so addictive. Like, just keep going back to this. It's not about the children not being able to control them. So, yeah. like, adults cannot control how they use no. their phone. It's very difficult. And to expect a child, when you're going through all of those sort of, those teenage years, that bit of, so the year from 12 to 13, in my second, that was the most miserable, sort of socially difficult year for me. Yeah. And I think for a lot of particularly girls, your hormones are going everywhere. You're all being vile to each other. I have really strong memories of that year being very tricky. And the idea of having to also navigate that while it's in your pocket at home and you can't go home and just not talk to anyone. Yeah. It's terrifying. Yeah. My, my eight-year-old already has a, a need to have downtime. Uh, so she uses yeah. Lego and a little bit of uh, time in the garden or a bit of reading. Uh, sometimes we'll do like yoga together. So, yeah, I can't imagine what she'd be like when she hits puberty in that respect and that kind of feeling of pressure 
because we've already had like issues with anxiety and so on and being through um, NHS and CAMS uh, services to support her on that. So I think for me, this whole kind of like living your life on social media and seeing the negative impact of that on the young people that I teach, it just, yeah, it fills me with dread that whole kind of that time period in my own family's life. And I, I really do hope that the conversations around, let's say, tech companies being like enforced that that they that social media no longer you can sign up to it under the age of 16 i think did you see what was going on at the moment with the change in the age for i think it was it was whatsapp wasn't it this last week yeah yeah and it's just crazy to bring the age down on something where kids could share inappropriate pictures or they could become part of a group where there is that kind of inability, like you said, to understand what is good digital kind of understanding. Gen Z, who are around 20. Yes, I think that's right, yeah. (laughs) God, I sound like an old lady. Um, But it's interesting to see there's a pushback with those, with Gen Z, the, the sort of recently qualified teachers who are in that bracket who were the first generation to be brought up on smartphones and with access to smartphones constantly and that they have a pushback and they have real issue with millennial parents such as myself I think there was an article in the New York Times towards the end of last year and it was a kind of open letter from gen- like newly qualified teachers saying uh, to uh, to my generation basically saying like what are you doing yeah <laughs> this was awful by the way please don't subject your children to this which is interesting to see that coming out from the younger generation. Mm, yeah, definitely. It would be great to see what happens over the next couple of years with, with, with the conversation being more in the media as well. And the number of articles over the last couple of months that have come out, it's, it's good that we're starting to at least have conversations about it. Whereas previously it did feel like it's, yeah. oh, kids just get a smartphone because they go to secondary school. Maybe the government will see this as a, if there's enough parents saying that they want smartphones to be banned from schools, for instance, especially secondary, maybe they will see that as an opportunity to, maybe we can win election with this, parents want this. So maybe that might help in a a roundabout way, possibly. hard argument. Yeah, it's a hard argument with the children, with with our children. We were talking about at the beginning, if we both just go back to having a sort of brick phone, Mm -hmm then that's a much easier argument to have because we don't have a smartphone. We have one for work, but that's it. And it doesn't have a SIM card in it. And we just use it for work in the office and then we don't use it. It feels, it's trickier once you, you know, if you've got one and then you're, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, it feels very, it worries me quite a yeah. lot. How do you think we can put pressure on tech companies to help protect childhood and children? So I used to work in the EU years ago in health and environment lobbying, which is quite fun. I think coming together with other parents, and I think that's where the Smartphone Free Childhood does such a good job, is that they've managed to bring it together, all of these parents. It's just that just because it's on WhatsApp, I don't read it anymore. But I think that's it, isn't it? It's the sort of collective voice. The tech companies are so slippery because they are so big. There's a monopoly with, what, four or five companies and the governments are fairly scared of them or scared of doing anything to get in their way. Yeah, Yeah, once I get down this deep hole, it does spiral quite quickly. But I think what is a collective voice about asking tech companies to do something about it, but also just getting into the government that this is a really big issue and people are very worried about it, especially when you look at all of the... So now all of the numbers that Jonathan Hyatt's been bringing up, he's been banging this drum for ages and no one's really been listening to him <laughs> until the last kind of six months. But I think he is saying previously, five years ago, you could have argued that there was some kind of grey area in terms of impact on mental health. But now if you just look at suicide and self-harm rates, there's a pretty yeah. solid, uh, it's pretty bleak. Yeah. If we can get something discussed at a parliament level, then they might start putting pressure on tech companies, but I think it has to come from government legislation. I don't think the tech companies really want to do anything. Yeah. Or they do a little checkbox that says, by the way, this content is really unsuitable. Just make sure you've ticked the box before you watch it. That's not a thing. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I know already that by going to my daughter's friend's uh, house uh, that is happy to have screen time, lots of it. My daughter's had conversations with me around inappropriate content. She saw an advert for some kind of like fantasy graphic novel and the character had like a bloodshot eye and a ripped face. And it obviously had upset her, didn't upset a friend, but upset her. So she came and talked to me about it the next day. And it was great that she was happy to have that conversation. And it wasn't that she was telling tales on a friend. She was just telling me that she'd seen something uncomfortable. And how did she talk to a friend and a friend's family about the fact that she doesn't actually want screen time, that she wants to play outside with her friend on the trampoline and play dolls still and all those kind of childhood things that eight-year-olds do. And we had quite an interesting conversation about different families doing different things and having different values or different ways of interacting. And I think it is that, it's that having that open conversation so that we talk to kids about what might they come across online so that when if they are exposed to something that they didn't want to see or hear, or that they can come to an adult and talk talk to them about it. Obviously, it's then involved a really difficult conversation for me and my husband with that family. But if we hadn't had that kind of honesty, we wouldn't have known that she'd had that experience. Yeah. And you don't want to prevent those difficult conversations because that's just yeah. part of being... If we all isolate in our own bubbles, then we're definitely putting ourselves into more and more extreme kind of political yeah. spheres and keeping ourselves... Part, then down the road it leads to a lot of problems and you do want to be able to your kids need to be able to learn to adapt and be happy in different settings i'm curious if anything else really positive came out from that experience at christmas that's spilled over into your life yeah at the moment we've been looking at we moved back to scotland last year and we live pretty rurally in east of scotland we don't have very good after school care really mm. at all we're lucky we live to my parents but my sister and my brother also have kids and they live next door to my parents too so my parents are not full-time childcare, and so we've had to shift how we work quite dramatically in that we there's only two days a week where we can both work long longer hours to six and the rest of the time we're yo-yoing after school so we're looking at ways that ebb and flow between how many after school clubs we can be bothered to, to sign up our children for i think be bothered is correct because i think what we've been toying with wild strong here is whether we could do a kind of after school club where the kids just come and play in the woods and we run a class for mm. adults and the kids can join in if they want but actually most of them if they're four or five they tend to stick around but most of them once they've got into it and they've come for a few weeks, they feel brave enough to go yeah. into the woods. And we know there's no kind of, yeah. there's no drowning opportunities yeah. there. <laughs> it's a wood. I mean, they might fall out of a tree and break their arm or poke an eye out. That's a risk. Normal take, risk, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And we can't see it's far enough away that we can't see yeah. them. We can occasionally hear them, but it's also far enough away that if anything goes wrong, they can come back, but it really has to go drastically wrong. So if they start bickering or something, they just sort yeah. it out because it's yeah. far enough away. And that's been interesting. It's like a downtime for them. We don't really interact with them for about an hour and a half. And it's just a sort of crowd of children in the woods. And then we spend about half an hour trying to get them out of the woods at the end. And that was nice. It's, oh, maybe it's like a sort of different after school care where we as adults get to go and move and have a nice time and catch up with each other and work on different movement skills and the kids just kick around and we're not entertaining them. It felt like a strange sale when we put it up. We were, is anyone interested in coming along for a class that's ultimately for adults, but the children are there and they can either join in or, or they can not join in. We don't really mind. And actually there was, it's been quite a big uptake on that, which is interesting because actually there are a lot of parents that, would like to do something for themselves but still have to have the kids around but but that is like a sort of decompression zone mm. after school they just drag right. about it, so it sounds <laughs> brilliant it sounds exactly the sort of thing that I need in my own local area because uh, my husband works nights so I spend a lot of time just me and my daughter in the evenings and makes it really difficult because a lot of the classes they don't let you bring along a child 
we've looked at like doing joint yoga classes and because she's obviously still quite young at eight every single yoga teacher said no sorry I don't do mother and daughter or child and parent classes I could do something online but it's not quite the same I'd quite like to go somewhere and if it was outdoors that's even better because just getting out getting that fresh air being around nature I think is just really important I like the sense of community that you're developing there as well for the kids as well that ch- that chance to maybe like bond and talk to children that they wouldn't normally speak to that maybe they wouldn't come across because maybe their parents are not necessarily going in a group of friends to your classes and I imagine that's really healthy as well. Yeah, it's nice seeing it's nice seeing that when they go back to the same place every week because it's in yeah. the same woods, they jump in the woods and they evaporate and mm. then they play pretty much the same games because it's like, oh, we're back here, so we'll go and play this game again. But it's really nice. Yeah, I think I think quite we're lucky where we live because there is a similar kind of third place where um, the village hall has like a little wooded area. And as soon as there's a birthday party for the kids in the village hall, it usually ends up in the forested bit anyway. <laughs> the child entertainers in there still trying to entertain half the kids while the rest of them have ran off to the wood. And it, and it's really nice yeah. that where we live, we've got access to that. And I think it's like you said, coming back to that, that privilege of having a place to live that has those little elements where kids can roam free and that there are other parents who feel similar to that, that kids should be given that opportunity to possibly exposed to risk a little bit because that's what we used to do as kids. And now we see lots of mental health issues in young adults and when I speak to the students I teach, it's because some of them have, have said to me that they weren't even allowed to walk down their own street until they were age 14 to go to the bus stop, to go to school. Yeah. And it's, wow, at the age of seven, I walked to school on, on my own sometimes. <laughs> and I lived yeah. in suburbia in Middlesbrough when I was a kid. And that was just normal. And we have now got to that point where because we're being made aware of things in the media that we've gone to the extreme of now feeling we've got to protect our kids all the time and it's just not healthy. There's a study and I think it's from Natural England and it was a few years back and I think it was William Bird who was in Natural England at the time and it looks at the, the, the distance that eight year olds within a family over generations were allowed to walk on their own. So it looks at the great grandfather who is in the nineteen twenties and he could walk eight miles to a river and go fishing and then go back on his own. And then it looks at his son or his daughter and it keeps going through the and it goes down basically from eight miles to now of two hundred meters. The visual for it is really profound and shocking when you look at it. I think the other thing that I picked up on your, your website was that you've got a very kind of inclusive groups for Wild Strong. So your coaches are also members of Wild Strong. They're trained by you and they're just normal people. Sometimes you get a kind of a type that is goes to the gym constantly, has spent their entire life kind of building up their fitness levels. And then when you go to one of those sessions, it, it can be an intimidating. But I love the idea that your coaches are also members themselves. My husband has yeah. a fitness background and he found it quite transformative in his early 20s and then went on to be a PT and was a PT for a while and then ended up training personal trainers and running mm-hmm. the courses for personal trainers. But he found, I guess with social media and things, there's a real pressure on personal trainers that you've got to, especially if you're male, you've got to have your stuff yeah. off and you've got to be ripped. And yeah, it's just not his vibe. And he finds social media really uncomfortable generally, so it's very hard mm-hmm. to get him on anything. And I think he didn't want to work anymore with the people that are happily going to the gym because those guys are fine and you, they can do what they want. Um, so he's pivoted and did a master's in public health and then ended up working for NHS. At the same time, I don't have a background in exercise, but actually in hindsight, I realized I've been very physically active all of my life. I didn't have a formal exercise background. I've always been really happy outside and running about the place, but um, because I didn't do sport, I just didn't see myself as someone that would fit in a gym. As in my adult life, it just felt way out of my sort of zone of comfort and also possibility 
And now I've realized that three years down the line, I'm, I'm much fitter and stronger than I've ever been, but still out of my zone of possibility. I'm just not, I'm not interested in going to a gym or a boot camp. And I think that's what we cottoned on early with Wild Strong is actually there are a lot of people who don't fit that mold and don't see themselves as exercises. But as we all become aware now, as we get older, that we actually do need to be getting stronger, particularly with women and muscle loss and bone density loss and need to be doing it and we need to be doing more than yoga yes. and that's not enough yeah. on yoga and I still do yoga yeah. but we need a mix and as we get older we need to be able to confidently move through life so that we can keep participating and that can be getting down to the ground and picking up your yeah. child or your grandchild or getting over a fence so that those obstacles don't prevent you from joining in in whatever life throws yeah. at you which is a lot and so yeah it's interesting watching that skill building element within the class setting sorry I am circling back to coaches we try within the classes to use a lot of play and it's interesting with the family movement clubs you can say play and everyone gets it they're like great yeah get children playing but when you put it within an adult context you can sort of almost mm. hear people's eyes rolling and I think I do it as well like if I'm at a conference or something and someone says let's play a game <laughs> Oh, please no. <laughs> but if we sneak it in, um, we have 70-year-olds playing Flores, Flores Lava and all sorts of ridiculous games that we've made up that just get them moving, get them into sort of weird positions and thinking about all of the ways that your bodies can move. And a lot of that within the class setting is we split people into twos and we get them to coach each other. And that's very nice so watching that. Is it Jonathan Friedman? <laughs> If you want to master something, yeah. teach something, teach it. And I'm sure you know that as a teacher, but it's really good. It gives you time with one other person to have a chat and go over a movement or a sort of skill or a problem that you need to solve. If, um, if listeners want to find out more about Wildstrong, whereabouts are you based at the moment? Because I know you've got a couple of different franchises, franchisees, sorry. Where, yeah. Whereabouts where, might we find you in person and online? <laughs> yeah, so we've got a few different groups. We have some franchises. We've also got lots of coaches that run their own their own thing, not under our umbrella. So you can find everything on our website, which is wildstrong.co. No, UK. <laughs> Just go. But yeah, we are based in Scotland. We've got two in Scotland and then three in England and one in Wales. But we've also, we've got a kind of online course you can do with a friend or a family member, which is really nice. We we didn't want to just be producing kind of online movement sessions. There's a lot of people doing that. We wanted to do something where you could go and do it with a friend and learn more about how your body moves. And a lot of people have been doing it with their mums, which I really, of, of my generation, have been doing it with their mums who are in their kind of 70s, which is really... Yeah, yeah that, that sounds brilliant. It's my, my mother-in-law is in her 80s and still doing rambling and organic gardening and allotments and all sorts of stuff. And uh, I look at her and think, wow, she's so much fitter than me uh, because she's absolutely has kept up that movement yeah. and flexibility. She's got more stamina than I have. And it really is making me think, right, now's the time to actually sort this out and to do something that I want to do and enjoy. And I love the, the philosophy you've got about finding movement that fits your mood and listening to what your body needs. And it, I've been listening to mine recently, sort of, and realising that that when I'm getting stiff from weeding, it's because I'm not really thinking about the movements that I'm making. And then when I do a big batch of gardening, my body's not used to it. So it's it, it's not working as well as it could do. So it's definitely something that I'm, I've been looking at locally to see what I can do to help support me and motivate me to do the things that are going to be good for me. I'm curious, finally, what's next for Wild Strong and your family and screens and so on? What's your plans? <laughs> so we have and we're developing a kind of new version of Wildstrong, which I, I haven't quite worked out what the name is yet, but that'll be free to user in cities, working with local authorities. That's exciting and feels much more in line with where we've wanted to go for a while. And then we're also looking at more ways to work with schools. Our family movement clubs are really fun. We only run them once a month. We have a kind of family movement guide that I'll put 
on your website for people to download as well. We're working out whether there's a kind of programme that we could do alongside schools to give them more opportunities to, particularly the kids that don't see themselves as sporty, that actually movement can be lots of different things and it doesn't have to be exercise. Um, Exercise is is a pretty weird concept that we invented because we all (laughs) stop moving. And not for everyone like you don't need to be an exercise yeah. I love that. it I, lo- I love that kind of I think I think that kind of sums up well strong for me actually a little bit is that idea that this is about movement and and coming together a, a, as a group of people to enjoy that kind of understanding of your own body and and being in the environment rather than being trapped at home in front of a tv or a monitor watching a yoga or a gym class or, and sweating it out, but actually yeah. not really having that sense of other people to join in with. And that is really, I think, what makes it really sound so wonderful and inviting. So I wish you all the best with that, Jill, and look forward to seeing how the uh, the children's sessions and so on continue to develop as well. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Curious About Nature. If you would like to keep getting nature and outdoor learning stories and tips, Hit subscribe on the podcast so you never miss an episode. Don't forget to give a five-star rating and review to support our podcast reach. To deepen your child's connection with nature and natural world education, please check out the Nature Curious subscription box. Head over to the website buttercuplearning.com to further support your family's nature journey.